Hello, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. My name is Sujin Kang, and I'm the Senior Events Manager here with the CMX and Bevy team. And welcome to today's CMX Masterclass. Hooray! Thanks so much for tuning in. We are so excited to host the session for all of you, and thanks again for tuning in and joining us. As a brief introduction, CMX is the largest and most active group of community professionals in the world, and we're here to provide connections and resources for community builders just like you. So for the next 45 minutes together, we'll hear from our amazing speakers here on today's topic on community leadership, how to grow, innovate, and plan for intentional rest. And after that, we'll close our time with the Q&A for about 15 minutes or so. And so if you have any questions, feel free to click the Q&A button at the bottom there, and you can upvote your questions, and we'll go ahead and um, close our time with the Q&A there. And of course, the session will be recorded and posted onto our YouTube channel. So please stay tuned for that and we'll be sure to post that afterwards. So with that said, I'm so happy to introduce today's speakers, Rebecca Marshburn, who is the amazing head of community over at Common Room, who I had the pleasure of speaking with on stage at last year's CMX Summit, which was really, really fun um, about creating memorable events. And we also have Nikki Thibodeau, who's here is a senior manager of community and customer advocacy at Calix. So I'll allow them to share more about themselves. The ladies, thank you so much for being with us today and go ahead and feel free to take it away. Okay, hello everyone. And thank you so much for joining us from so many different places, um, East Coast, West Coast, outside of the United States. Um, I love how people are actually saying the neighborhoods that they're joining from in some of these cities, which is always really um, kind of an exciting way to, I think, to sort of get to know, you're like, oh, I see where you're at. Okay, I see you over there downtown. I see you over there, Panhandle. <laughs> um, I love that. So thank you so much for having us, Eugene, and um, to the whole CMX crew. You all have been the best, as always. Really appreciate being here. Um, before we kick off, I just want to make sure, can everyone see the screen as is expected? Um, Nikki, it looks good to you. It's, awesome. it's good to me, yeah. Okay. Um, so here we are. We're here to talk today about community leadership. Um, you know, the session is called How to Grow, Innovate, and Plan for Intentional Rest. And to sort of set the stage for this, um, community is personal, right? I think that's a reason why we're all here. And like this presentation is, is personal too for both um, Nikki and I. I think we as community leaders care so much about how our community members feel um, if we're doing right by them, if as our roles in which we are paid for companies, if, if we're working well for them, how those things come together, how we balance those things. And so I think stepping into a community space and stepping away from a community space is also really personal. And so we're actually going to start with almost that personal point of view, right? Like how we got to what this presentation is. But the fact that this personalness added to the fact that I think every time that we as community leaders have the opportunity to speak publicly is also an opportunity to elevate the voices of our community members and to elevate the community role as a profession as a whole. Um, it's such a it's such a privilege. And honestly, I'm like nervous. I'm like more <laughs> nervous for this presentation than I have been for a lot of presentations, I think because it is something that is really personal um, for me. And I know for Nikki uh, and um, and for how we want to show up for our community. So thank you again for being here and um, for going on this personal this personal journey with us. Um, with that, hello from us. Who are we? Um, Nikki, I will let you uh, take it away, and then and then I'll come back. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah, I'm stoked to be here. I wasn't nervous until I saw the names coming in, and I was like, oh man, <laughs> okay, we're doing this for like really tenured humans and we're going to be very vulnerable today and show you the deets and so I'm, I'm also a little bit nervous. Um, but uh, I have just a little bit about me. My name is Nikki Thibodeau. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I've been a community manager in a local city. I've led a global team of community managers. Um, I've been in community operations and community strategy and now I have the wonderful pleasure of being the senior manager of community and customer advocacy at Calix. Um, I'm also the founder of the Community Community, which is a community for senior community professionals. A lot of you are in there, um, and it's just so cool to see you all here. 
Um, but I'll pass it back to you, Rebecca. Um, it's so cool to see you here, Nikki. I like, I'm so excited. <laughs> Uh, so I'm Rebecca Marshburn. I'm the head of community at Common Room. Uh, we call our community the Uncommon Community, and it's a community of community. Where this is going to be that game again? Can we say it? How many times? Uh, yeah, of community professionals, developer relations leaders who are also you know building their own communities, but often with like a technical or that sort of um, developer open source type of experience. But I would say in general, it's community builders overall, right? And then, and then we're starting to welcome new personas, like in the GTM persona, who are people who are really looking forward and trying to understand how to better work with community leaders and work with their community teams and what that actually means to find the right balance. Um, so the Uncommon Community hosts conversations between professionals, you know, people that are interested in the space, new people who are stepping into the role, people who are tenured and have been in it for a long time, to ideate, share expertise, ask questions. Um, and really have an open and healthy and safe space for conversations around how to best use the tools that are coming out to enable us to do our jobs better and how to just think about like think through best strategies and best practices. Um, I was previously at AWS. I did uh, some work around the AWS serverless heroes or or a lot of work, I guess, around the AWS serverless <laughs> heroes, which is, which is how I started to learn about the power of community, honestly, back, back when I was in that role um, many years ago. Um, I also, I identify with the pronoun she, her, you can find me at Becca Odley on Twitter and, um, and find me on LinkedIn and in the Uncommon community. Um, anything else you want to add, Nikki, before we, before we dive in? Let's just get into it. I'm sorry. Right, let's get personal. All right. It's time. Yeah. Let's, let's do it. Time to get personal. Um, so what we'll cover today, we're going to cover four main topics. The first one we're going to start off with is this idea of community manager self-care. And um, Nikki and I will present a few things about what this means to us. And we also know that this means different things to different people. And we totally invite you in the chat to talk about what it looks like for you. Um, and then we'll also talk about how that, how community manager self-care, like how that influenced, right? How it, how the interim community leadership role came to be, which is what Nikki stepped into. Um, we'll talk about preparing for a community transition when you have time to prepare which we know is a luxury. Um, and then we'll also talk about managing community transition when you didn't have time to prepare. So maybe you stepped into a role in that community, um, didn't have a manager or a leader or anyone really looking after it for weeks or months or even a year, right? Or someone left a team and you're, they're like, hey, you're, you're going to do this now. And so, so many ways that this might end up happening. So we'll talk about managing that community transition and, and ways to sort of mitigate what might be overwhelming. Um, and then lastly, we'll talk about if we had a time machine, what we would repeat, um, what Nikki and I feel like went well in our community transition, and then what we would change. And honestly, I think there's um, things to say truly about both. Things we were like <laughs> A plus and things we were like eh, C minus. Uh, <laughs> so we'll talk about those things. Um, so let's get kicked off with community manager self-care. And so we, um, as you'll see throughout this presentation, we sort of break it down into headlines of four buckets, and then we'll dive deeper into each of those buckets. But I wanted to give you, all of you, a second um, to kind of think about, right, like what are these different buckets of what it means to practice community manager self-care? You know, there's, is it personal time? Is it taking personal space? Is it pursuing personal goals outside of your profession? Or the personal goals within your profession, right? Career growth goals or trajectory that you're, you know, maybe you want to manage people, maybe you want um, to manage like external community contributors, all sorts of ways this could look, um, and then setting healthy boundaries. So these are the four buckets that we put it in. Again, invite you in the chat to talk about other large buckets that maybe you think um, should appear on this list. And then this is um, honestly how it ended up manifesting for us. We wanted to give some ideas about uh, what this feels like for us. Um, and so for, for me, for example, one of the biggest drivers of me um, asking my, my team at Common Room, it's like, hey, there are things that I really feel like make me me. And a lot of it has to do with creative pursuits. I'm a poetry lover. I'm a, a teacher of yoga. These different things that I, I really care about and research deeply and spend a lot of time trying to nurture these other parts of me and uh, to pursue the things that make me me. And um, I, I was starting to get into this, this cycle of, of not serving or pursuing any of those other things that I really, really like about myself. And that is not um, 
a reflection on how amazing the team is at Common Room or how amazing my leadership is. It's a reflection of, I know that for me, I can get into this cycle where, where I love my job and I love community members and I see all the ways that I could be doing more. And I just focus so far in that direction that I really have to step back and be like, am I serving the other things that make me me? Do I need uh, more personal space? Do I need to actually physically create space so that I can sort of reset? Um, am I looking at my personal goals for the things I'd like to pursue and how I would like to get there um, from a holistic point of view outside of um, my, my professional life? And so these are the things that actually led me to start having these discussions with, um, with the team at, at Common Room and how we ended up saying, okay, maybe take, you know, I, I ended up taking two and a half months off. And in that time, we were like, we're going to hire an amazing interim community manager. Um, we're, we want to make sure that community members are served. We want to make sure there's no disruption in what they can expect or the value they'll get from the community. And we also believe that community managers do need to practice self-care. So how do we model that behavior? And how do we learn how to do it best so that when other community managers need to do the same thing, maybe they have a little bit more guidance. Um, so that's sort of how this interim role came to be. And Nikki, I'd love to pass it to you to talk about some of the ways this manifests for you. Yeah, I think like really front of mind was um, a, a year ago yesterday, I was laid off from uh, my role at Shopify. And uh, I think like the healthy boundaries part or what you had mentioned at the beginning, Rebecca, about, um, you know, community really bring a lot of your whole self to the space because you're creating authentic relationships and um, and so when, when you have those unhealthy boundaries, then you end up creating a space where if, you know, say you're laid off or say you need a break, it's almost impossible to pry yourself away. And so, um, one of the big things about, that was so important about this slide for me was that it's you giving you permission to take personal time, to take personal space, to have personal goals. Like it's really important, um, you know, that tried and true saying of like putting your own oxygen mask on first, it, it really is pertinent in the community space because we're helping humans. And so um, setting those healthy boundaries, like you are not your job, um, you're unreachable after 5 p.m. At, at Calyx, one of the things that's really great is they give us um, a cell phone that we can put all of our Calyx stuff onto. And so I don't have anything on my personal phone. And so as soon as I log out at 5 p.m., you can't get a hold of me. Um, and it, those types of things are really important to my mental health and well-being. Yeah, and I loved how you, uh, Nikki, on the, in this slide, so, I mean, full transparency, I think you all know we, we collaborated on this. Um, <laughs> and I love, so some of these bullet points are strictly Nikki's, right? Where I think they're really, really concrete things that you can do, like, as you said, I am unreachable after five. I take vaca vacations and I do not bring my laptop, right? Um, for me, one thing I, I, I did is we don't have like no meeting uh, days at, at work, um, at, at my role at Common Room, but we are, I mean, um, we're very trusted, right? To do our work and, and do it in the way that serves us best. Um, and, and as long as we're like reaching our goals and communicating about it. And so one thing that I did is, I realized that I need to actually set up my own no meeting day. And so I have no meet personal no meeting Wednesdays. So I can fully feel productive and accomplished and deliver to stakeholder teams what they were looking for. And I need that time to actually do that. And so I do think this manifests in a lot of different concrete ways, as well as ways where it's more of like an introspective way to be like, you know, am I just giving myself the time to consider whether or not I'm pursuing the things that make me me? Um, giving myself the physical, mental, or emotional space and things like that. Yeah. And I can see in the chat, Genevieve said, you know, I'm a huge proponent of scheduling time every week for your own space and personal development, whether it's daily lunch breaks or a weekly spot for taking a class or to volunteer, making space is important. And I'd love to see more in the chat. Like, what are some things that you do that help you create space for self-care? Yes, Gabby, they're so critical. Um, no meeting days are like, yeah. And it's it's amazing how much work can get done and so much work can also get done in meetings. Um, but I am the type of, I've learned over time, I'm the type of person who needs to take that, what I've learned in a meeting or heard in a meeting, I need to process it and then I need time to act on it. I have worked with some people 
who are truly uh, like superheroes where they'll hear one thing in their ear and they'll be able to like type and respond to it and like ideate in real time. Mm -hmm. And um, that is not one of my superpowers. And so I need that space to take it, process it, and then work through it. Um, and so I think it's also really important to just take time to understand how you work best. And honestly, it's taken me like 15 years to understand that. So, um, <laughs> really so I just cool. encourage people to keep, keep working on what that understanding is and allow it to change over time. It truly might change over time as you, you know, evolve in your role or evolve in knowing of yourself or just um, change in the way that you interpret information or, or ingest information. Um, Nikki, thank you for, I have like multiple windows open as I'm running this. So I also <laughs> appreciate you calling things out in the chat. Um, so let's talk about preparing for community transition. And this is right in the parentheses when you have time. And Nikki and I, you know, both want to say that we know that this is a, a special opportunity that doesn't happen all of the time. Um, and so I just want to recognize like what a privilege it was that we got to know this was coming. I got to reach out to Nikki and say, um, you know, I, I saw that you were laid off. So I think you have time and, and <laughs> how lucky am I? How lucky is the community, right? Like, would you be open to this? Can we talk? Um, and so that was a, a really special moment. And it was really special that we then had time to onboard, right? Like I think Nikki and I, you started meeting 10 days in advance or 14 days even, and then off board too. So we built in those buffer times um, because we had the luxury of time. And so the four buckets that we broke this down into about what was most important in preparing for transition was defining the must-haves and the nice-to-haves, um, and then aligning internal goals. So making sure that you know what our internal teams and, and at Common Room we roll up into um, marketing and, and GTM overall, um, what that looks like for the stakeholders at the top, which in this case at the time was our directly our COO, Jake Randall. Um, and then collaborating on how to reach those internal goals. This is specifically collaborating between Nikki and I, and then setting her up for success as best as possible for what that means when she collaborates with our internal teams. Um, and then setting realistic expectations, right? Like how do you actually prepare for transition and be like, here's what we're gonna wanna do, but like, here's actually what we'll like, <laughs> right? And then um, and trying our best to be honest with ourselves about work takes so much time. And I think we all want to be like, ah, I've been doing this for 10 years. This like, that'll be fast. And it's just not always fast. And like, that's okay. <laughs> um, so how do we set those realistic expectations? Um, Nick, is there anything you want to add before I go, before I unveil? Let's unveil. No, okay, let's, let's unveil. We're doing it. Um, so here's what that looks like, right? Defining the must-haves and nice-to-haves. The must-haves I ended up breaking down into um, time, time boxes, right? So this is what we have to do on the daily. And that's like everyday community management, right? Like are people getting their questions answered? Um, is there a thread that we could really, that is like really juicy that we should really highlight for other people? Did we see that one conversation in one place is happening in another channel as well? And how can we bring those conversations together? Do we know someone who's very accomplished in their industry that maybe didn't see the thread that we could tap and say, hey, I would love to see your expertise in this thread. It would be um, so beneficial for the community members to see. So those are those daily type of things, right? Um, and then weekly must-haves. Um, so this is going to be things like we have our community and product office hours every Tuesday, um, and then monthly must-haves. So these are our newsletters. These are uh, one, um, one event per month. Um, I'm sort of like simplifying all these different things, but we broke it down. <laughs> these like uh, daily, weekly, monthly. And then ultimately, like for Nikki's term, right? Like what might we want to, what do we hope emerges from that? And then we had nice to haves, right? There are so many, um, there's so many things and ways, there's so many ways you can be collaborating with your other teams. So it's like, you know, that our growth marketing team wanted to run an experiment um, where we're, we're on LinkedIn, we're saying, hey, join a, join a, you know, a seasoned community veteran to understand like how you might grow your community better and like how might we, um, propose that on LinkedIn and see if we can uh, broadly like create more awareness around, you know, the existence of common room and the uncommon community and um, doing internal collaboration. So that's like distribution experiments, right? Doing workflow or messaging refinements, like AB testing, like does this survey serve community members and get us better information so we can serve them better than this survey. Um, and then like industry community engagement, how do we make sure that we're showing up in 
amazing communities like CMX and like Rosie Land and like Guild and like Led by Community to make sure that we're seeing outside of just our own uncommon community lens, but how are we also elevating the community profession as a whole? So these are like all these things that we that we do, but not on a time boxed basis and that are a nice to have depending on you know how much time Nikki had left in, in her day, honestly. Um, also then in aligning internal goals. So at the time, Nikki, uh, I was, and Nikki was as well, reporting directly to our COO. And so we wanted to define how we engaged and grew the community community in tandem with the objectives that we had from a go-to-market business point of view. And so there was like a few ways that we wanted to approach this, right? From the community side of things, it was, uh, we had like three goals. And that was like to be the best version of, self, of ourselves, um, to empower members to build communities with best practices, to walk our talk, to make sure that we were modeling what we talk about and learn from our own community members about what best practices are, and then to elevate the community function overall. So those are like what we wanna do and serve as community leaders. But then we also want to be like, okay, so what are our business goals? And like, how do we align with those? And one, it's we we really believe at Common Room and, and myself included, um, big reason why I work here, <laughs> is that uh, that we, we believe that community accelerates business growth, but we need to be able to prove that, right? And so one way that we believe that we can do that and that community is a space for that is that community can accelerate um, the process of someone finding out about your product, understanding how others are using it or finding out about the industry space, learning that there's a place to enrich yourself and your growth. And then ultimately be like, oh, I, I see how I could use this product better. I understand how it fit into my community stack. I understand how it beneficially impacts my work. And they become in a faster way, you know, an MQL and ultimately perhaps um, a paid customer, a paid customer because they're finding value in it and they find value faster because they understand how other people are using it and utilizing it. Um, and so that's the business goal, right? Like, how do we prove that community accelerates awareness and MQLs? Um, another one is that we wanted to uh, prove that community can accelerate deal to close, uh, or sorry, time to close for a deal. And um, our my sales team's member, my sales team, my sale, my members of my sales team, my colleagues <laughs> who are in sales, um, <laughs> they, they joke about, they call, or not joke about, but there's a term where they say, you know, it's you'll get bluebird deals in the, it's a called a bluebird deal because it falls out of the sky and within eight days it closes when usually your closing cycle might be 30 days or 40 days. And they're like, Oh, it's just, you know, it, it was just perfect timing. And now they're like, ah, the answer this whole time was community. We just didn't know in the back end that that's what was happening. There used to not be a way to track that someone interacted in your community first or asked questions on a forum first and got to learn about what you were doing first back in the day when they were at places like Drift and, and other amazing companies that they've joined us from, they were like, yeah, we'd get this Bluebird deal. And we just thought that it was magic. And really it's community work that's powering that. Um, and so there, there we've been like doing um, impact study reports now with many of our customers. You can actually prove that community oftentimes will accelerate time to close. So from a business outcome, we want to align that type of goal. And then the third type of goal that Nikki and I had talked about that you don't see on the slide specifically bulleted out is that we wanted to prove that community and product release prioritization or marketing team efforts, they have a positive impact on each other. And so how do we help expand distribution, expand awareness, expand reach, use um, leverage our community members who are truly getting value and enjoying the space to become our, our, our champions, enable them, give them the ways, the knowledge that they need, the, the acknowledgement that they need to, um, to refer us, right? To tell people about us, to give us feedback for how to make the product better. Um, so those are like a few different ways where we're like, these are the internal goals that we want to align with, right? These are what we want to deliver from both a community leader point of view and from that point of view of how does community serve the business? Um, so then we wanted to collaborate on how to, uh, um, oh gosh, <laughs> I'm getting nervous again, on how to reach <laughs> community members, right? And like, or sorry, not how to reach our community members, how to reach those goals. And so Nikki and I spent a lot of time together, um, which was so fun. We called them partes. 
um, where we spent time like eight to 10 hours at a time, honestly, maybe more, Nikki, maybe 12, maybe I like under 12 to 14, um, where we're like, oh, we'll need, you know, three sessions. Oh, maybe we'll need four. <laughs> I think we need eight. Um, and we spent those sessions talking about those goals, both on the community side and the business side, and then ideating on them. And it's not, it wasn't necessarily pretty or it was just, it was ideas. It was ideas on a Google doc, right? And then it was comments and then more comments and then more ideas and shifting around and it was messy and it was messy in a beautiful way. And so we asked ourselves the questions, right? Is like, how do we serve as a community leader? As a member of this community, what do I wish to see, feel, learn and do? And are we reflecting that for our members? And then also on the product side, right? From a business point of view, how do we walk our talk? How do we be the best version of ourselves? How do we keep using Common Room and extend the use of Common Room to do things like drive distribution, drive referrals, encourage um, encourage like network effects, right? Increase member connectivity, drive MQLs. And then lastly, um, when we are preparing for transition, it's really important that we set realistic expectations. And so that was doing things like making sure Nikki knew who her points of contact were, um, getting her in touch with them so that they could have kickoff calls, truly bulleting out what Nikki was going to do, like what her must haves were and then what the nice haves were, and then prioritizing that for my internal team members and for our internal stakeholders, what that meant. So giving her the opportunity to have a reason to say yes or no and actually have structure and framework for understanding what types of things she should dive into and what types of things she should say, I need to reassess this. I need to evaluate whether or not this fits into what we've defined as is like an expectation and a deliverable. Um, and then last, lastly, benchmarking and evaluating like the true nature of an ask, right? So how do I, how do you set this person up, um, this next community leader up for success and understanding the framework from which they can make decisions and then who needs to be involved in those decisions? Um, Nikki, is there anything you wanna add here um, in terms of what your experience was from, from your side? Yeah, I think one of the things that I, I wanted to highlight was when we first started talking, um, we were, I, was, I said, oh, what are our, the goals of the community? And you're like, well, we have goals, but you're not going to be here long enough. We don't want to measure you against them. And um, I think what, one of the things we discussed was like, okay, but we, if we don't want to lose impact during this time, we still need to make sure that the things that are woven into must-haves and nice-to-haves do contribute to your goals. Because if I'm going to start up a net new program, um, we're obviously going to want it to serve goals. And so I think uh, if you have, like, this is a, a very specific scenario of like, oh, we know there's going to be um, a leave for two and a half months. Like, what do what do we do within that time frame? I think like always thinking for the long term and making sure that you um, don't just say, oh, it's okay. Like, these are the, the few things you need to do. Like, you can have bigger asks um, of the person stepping in. But also um, the best thing was these like noting the must haves and nice to haves. And you'll see these repeat when we talk more in terms of like when you don't have time to prepare for a transition, but um, noting what was important to do, especially as someone who only has two and a half months to both like onboard herself and get going, um, going back to that doc and saying, okay, I am doing the must haves, even though I feel like I'm a hamster, running a hamster wheel, trying to get to understand how to best do these nice to haves. Um, you can always have these things where you're like, okay, these are the things I have to do and I'm doing them. So I'm doing my job, <laughs> but I'm also going to be able to have impact in other ways. So very important. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I do think that that was also like that messiness of um, of ideas. Actually, maybe it's better to show it than say it. So yeah. it looks like this or here's like a little screenshot, right, of what it looked like. It's like That's this sort of page uh, document. <laughs> it, was like a, it was a document that started out as one page then two pages, then, then 25, 50. And then there's <laughs> all these links that go into other places where, you know, Nikki was amazing and made a, um, a, a presentation deck like while you were away. And so, but I, we're, I just show this to say, like, you can have this framework and structure to start the conversations, but that is only the start of the conversation and the start of the ideation. And so it truly was like, um, it can look messy, right? It can be like, 
here are your must haves, here's what you're gonna nail, great. And now here are the other ways that we might serve the community and the business. And as Nikki said, like, right, we wanted to do that. Um, it was almost a rubber band, like even though it's a short amount of time, how do you maybe set things up to be expanded more for the long term? As long as you know where you're going in terms of the, the community goals and business goals you want to serve, what can we maybe incrementally set up now and you can grow when you get back? So what seeds could Nikki plant, right? And so we won't necessarily go over this. I just wanted to show Nikki and I really wanted to be like, so what did this actually look like? And we're like, man, it, it looked messy, you know? It's like, we could do this. We could do this. What about this? Let's comment on this. Um, and so it really was just a moment during the transition and during this onboarding and offboarding boarding process to work with each other and learn from each other, even in the ideation phase. And then Nikki and I both really think in every single way that's possible, preparing for transition can also can be fun, right? And so we called every uh, meeting a parte and um, you know we scheduled these and we we're like, okay, we actually need like, I think we set up four to begin with. And then we were like, okay, let's get real. We're actually going to need like six, seven, eight. And this is going to be one hour. This will be two hours. This will be a deep dive. This will actually be us walking through Common Room, the product, to say what might we set up so that we can show people how to use this product best, but also be leaders in how we're doing that. And that means we need to think about the product and approach it with new eyes and how we might use it. Um, I think Max Pete is really good at, at saying this aloud, but... Um, so I want to borrow from inspiration from him, but he's so good, right, about reminding us that you can include or infuse even banal or normal or um, normal is not the right way to say it. You know, regular moments of every day with really small moments of delight for each other. And so even something as simple for us, we'd be like, oh, we have a party like, oh, I'm, I'm going to the party today. And so I think Nikki and I just all, also are like wherever you can. Transition can be really um, nerve wracking, right? Or you're overwhelming or you're just like, whoo, got a lot to do. And so wherever you can infuse that little bit of fun, like give yourself a parte. Um, so that that's about us being able to have the, the privilege and the opportunity and the luxury of knowing this is going to happen. So let's also talk about managing community transition when you don't have time. And I'm going to pass this over to Nikki because she has experienced this um, um, before and I think has even a more like a more rich and deeper understanding of what what is really important in this space this uncertainty and so here are four buckets and then Nikki I will let you take it away yeah so um, just contextually where my experience comes from is after I was laid off I started these contracts and when you're a contractor you need to just be able to perform immediately. Um, there's no, like luckily with Rebecca, I had, I had some onboarding time, but that doesn't often happen. And then just recently back in May, I started with Calyx. And again, you're, you're just starting and you're having to figure out your own process. And so um, within uh, this assess and prioritize responsibilities you inherited, um, if you have a community that was already started, you're going to have things like uh, meeting with the folks that were already close to the community um, and defining yourself, like what are the must haves that need to continue so your community manager or community members don't feel an interruption. And then like, what are the nice to haves? Like what are some things that have been, um, been going on and you could continue, but maybe you could stop them. Um, but then also like, what are some things that you immediately see that you could have an easy, quick win uh, that won't take too much uh, in this onboarding time? And then um, there's a bunch of other things in this, like assess the priorities. There's, you're gonna create your own five fifty page messy doc of like, these are the things I noticed. Um, one of the things I created when I first started at Calyx was I started a Miro board where I, showcased how the community served the um, customers, but then how each team that had their finger in the community pie was utilizing the community and what they wanted to achieve from it. And so as I was meeting these people who had influence over the community, um, I was documenting what it was that they cared about so that when I come back and have a conversation with them, I was able to say, hey, I know that you do X and I know it's because of Y. And these are the ways that I can help you do that. 
um, because now uh, in my role, we're bringing intention behind the community instead of just being um, the space that is like a nice to have, we're making it a must have. And so taking stock of what has been the setting yourself up with a self onboarding plan is massive, but I think it goes hand in hand with setting realistic expectations. Before I started at Calyx, I created a 30, 60, 90 day plan for myself. And I have to tell you that I missed the mark on every <laughs> month um, because I didn't understand how the business worked. I understood what I could do and I um, knew what was what I had done at previous goals, but I wasn't uh, aware of what happens internally at Calyx and the process and how, you know, where they are in their growth spurt, et cetera, and how fast they want to go. So um, what I ended up doing was creating a six week cycle. And I actually um, onboarded my team to that too. I have two, I'm so lucky. I have two direct reports um, to help me in that. And so I, I'd seen, I'm just going to like, I saw a question um, from Jenny in the Q and A. So make sure you put your questions in the Q and A, but um, of like how large are your community teams and um, at common room, it's Rebecca. <laughs> Rebecca is, <laughs> the community team. Um, and so, uh, which I think a lot of you can likely relate to. Um, and I currently have the privilege of having two humans on my team, which is a delight. <laughs> um, and then uh, I'll, I'm going to show you the six week cycle on the next slide, but um, the next part is involving the community. So the business is going to have ideas, all sorts of them, of what the community is for, um, especially if you've, I had a predecessor who was really good at getting people involved in community, but the one thing that what needed space or needs refinement is like um, having a community strategy where the, my, my analogy is that community is a pie and I, I want to serve the pieces out to you so that I can have all the ingredients and make sure it's going to be a good pie. Um, but right now everybody just has their fingers in my pie and I'm trying to like pry people's fingers out of them. Um, and so they're all gonna have an idea about like what the community should do. And, uh, but the other member or the other stakeholder in your community are your members. And so making sure that you're going to um, ask them their opinion of what the community is for uh, and one of the ways that we did that, um, and Rebecca made a really great point when we were talking about this, was um, you want to make sure that you are leaving room for all of the ways that people feel comfortable to give you feedback. And so uh, it can be live in your events, or it can be in on a message in your community. It can be through DMs. Um, you can use polls for anonymity. And so you want to make sure that not only are you involving the community, but you're being really transparent about the whole process. So Rebecca posted a message when she was first leaving um, saying, like, this is what's happening. Nikki's going to be here. Um, this is what we're trying to achieve during that time. And I'll be back on this day. And then I'm able to come in and say, hey, this is what I'm doing. This is what I think will happen and be able to be transparent to that process. But it's kind of the same thing when you come into a new role, being able to say, hey, I'm here now. Uh, maybe you didn't know who I was before, which was very much the case for me um, and it, within my new role. And so uh, making sure that people understand why you're there and what you're trying to do. Um, and then the set the realistic expectations. I wrote on this slide, you can be your own worst enemy here because I'm off in that. Um, and so, you know, what was easy at your last job may be difficult here. And so the, the 30, 60, 90 day plan are really important. And I um, got my lead to sign off on that when I first got there, but she kind of chuckled at me about like what I could achieve. Um, and then if you want to go to the next slide, Absolutely. one of the things, um, so I have here, this is the post that I made in our community 30 days after I started at Calyx, um, just to say, Hey, who I am and um, asking them what they would like to see with the community. And this opened the door for folks to hop into my DMs, to um, ask for things that maybe they've been asking for for a long time or haven't had the space to ask for. Um, and it starts that relationship off with your community. Um, and then the next thing here is the six week cycle. And so um, what I do for a six week cycle is I create the project 
and the project description. And those things are what you hope to achieve in like long-term strategy. And then you'll notice that there are goal deliverable outcomes. So what are you going to do in these six weeks to further that project along? And then mapping out those potential roadblocks have been really important for me and my team. Um, I unfortunately always bite off more than I can chew at the beginning, which I did here. Uh, you can see that in the week five check-in, it I pushed it to next cycle because I didn't get, I didn't understand the processes that were in place at Calix to be able to do these things. And so when you don't have someone like Rebecca telling you, hey, this is what happens. This is the process. Here's how you get access to this. This is the level of access you get. That's important too. Um, you're going to come into these roadblocks where you're like, where you couldn't have even imagined that they would be roadblocks. Um, I just assumed I'd be able to change copy on a page, but I can't. And so we have little things like that. Um, and then you can, you can redefine it on the next cycle. And I get my, so the company does not do six week cycles but I needed to do six week cycles for myself in order to make sure that I'm doing the right things. I'm asking the right questions and my lead can actually remove roadblocks for me. Um, and then there's one secret door number five uh, so that we talked about uh, the five, four things, but remember that you were hired for a reason. You are the expert. And um, Rebecca did a really good job of reminding me that um, when we were onboarding of just like, I was like, okay, well, what do you want to do? What do you want this to be? How do you want this to? And she was like, Nikki, we brought you on because you are also an expert in community. And this is an opportunity for us to grow with someone else's eyes on the prize. And so um, Brian Oblinger tells, says, said this to me one time and I can't forget it. But when you come into a company as the community lead, you are going to know know more about community or have forgotten more is actually what he says. You'll forget more about community than the people at your company will ever know about community. And so make sure to remember that you are the expert. Rebecca, is there anything you want to add to these? Just a couple of things. I mean, I want to double down on the fact that um, uh, to trust your own self and your own ability and that you were hired for a reason. Um, I think especially as community leaders, I know many people in many roles can do this, but as community leaders, you know there are so many things that you could be doing that I think it's always easy to question like, well, did I do the right ones? And did I do them well enough? And what was the quality bar? And should I have done more? And all of these questions. And the answer is like, you are enough, you have enough, you do enough, you are enough. And I think I've, I think I've actually written that too, Nikki. Um, but yes. but to also remember that like you being hired there for a reason, you being asked to 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 occupy that space for a reason because you are good at your job and there's value in what you do. And honestly, I was like, Nikki, I want to know what you think we should do because this is my opportunity to learn. Like you mm -hmm. have run community, we have we have we respect each other's styles, but they are different. We respect each other's ideas, but they are different. And that's the whole point, right? Is like, how would you approach this? With your expertise, how would you approach this? And I got to learn so much. Um, and we'll get to that in the next slide um, about, you know, if we had a time machine, what we would do again. And then we'll certainly leave like at least seven minutes for questions. Thank you so much for putting stuff into the Q&A. Um, so we'll go through kind of like that if we had a time machine a little bit faster. But the one thing I want to say about this, um, this managing transition when you don't have time is, uh, is is this um, when you set realistic expectations, one of my first bosses and mentors, honestly, I, I watched her in this, this really big product leadership role back when I was at Airbnb. And people would ask like the most outlandish things, you know, like, hey, can you build this feature in three days? And then can we acquire, you know, a million new users? That's facetious, but like things that felt that wild. And her ability to say X will not happen in Y days unless z changes unless i get x resources or you know this amount of money or we can hire this amount of people and onboard them this amount of time like she would say this will not happen in this amount of time unless this happens but what i can deliver is a prototype that will give us directional reasonable understanding of whether or not we should pursue what you're asking for so she was so good at saying no and so instead of yes, and, you know, like, yes, I'll do that and this, she was so good at saying, no, however, let's talk about what we could do 
to help us understand if we should do what you are asking. And I think just that ability to, again, lean into your own expertise is so important. So she was so good at being like, you know, I'm hired here for a reason to lead this for a reason. So let me make sure that I'm exercising my own expertise. And so I think there's also ways that that is so applicable in our community work as well. Um, so if we had a time machine, while I was away, what had happened? And, you know, would we do it again? And how did it go? And so, you know, we looked back at the what we did to prepare for a community transition with the luxury of time, those same exact buckets. Um, and then, you know, what what their assessment was. And so with must haves and nice to haves, I would say a B plus surprise pop quiz. I don't know, actually, Nikki and I did not talk about what she would grade it because I put this in here afterwards um, <laughs> as like a little surprise. Um, but while she's assessing what that grade might be, I think, you know, as Nikki had said, breaking this stuff out into time based responsibilities was was really clear and followable, followable and gave a great structure for her to start to make those decisions um, and then discussing opportunities like for those nice to haves was was useful. But really what was more powerful was giving her that framework and then allowing her the broadness of the how she would get there so that she could exercise her own expertise and her own creative self and approach it in her way rather than some way that I made up that might not fit like her preferred strengths in the way that she approaches community. Um, and then also with the must haves and nice to haves, it was a little tough, like there are shifting priorities, you know, as, as there are oftentimes in teams, especially in startups, there's the time it takes to ramp up and get to know you, um, get to know, you know, colleagues. Um, there's a challenge of the work, you know, internally um, in, in terms of her, her tenure being known to be temporary. So like, what does that mean and how much people ask? So I think in general, B plus in terms of like what that was like with the nice must haves and nice to haves, but um, room for improvement in terms of like, how giving maybe more latitude or, or pre-knowledge to understand how to make those decision trade-offs a little easier as shifting priorities happen internally. Um, did we build bridges between community and GTM goals? I would say indeed we did. Um, but I would say more importantly here, our internal teams gained a deeper understanding of the complexity and diversity of community work because they had only worked with me, many of my teammates have only worked with me as a community leader. And Nikki did have a different approach. And she has wildly, like she has strengths that are incredible and are wildly more advanced than mine. And so I asked people like, right, you know, when I got back, I was like, what did Nikki do so well that you wish would be continued even in her absence? And colleagues were like, she was incredible from representing for representing the voice of the community from day one. She was confident about it. She never shied away from it. We knew where the community stood. Um, she delivered really meaningful events and her collaborative spirit, even though it could be hard to step into that space. Um, and so moving on to the next bucket to make sure we have a little bit of time for questions. Did your new and ongoing programs work? I would say emphatically yes. And honestly, Nikki created many new things that the community still experiences today. There is a swag store where now when our amazing community contributors who go above and beyond um, active contributions, um, they they automatically we automatically send them a link to say, thank you so much for your contributions. Please grab something from our swag store. And Nikki set that swag store up, making that workflow and that acknowledgement possible. Um, she helped define the style of events that people love most that we've felt uh, that community members have felt resonated most, which is like a very casual but honest and candid learning from others type of approach. Um, she extended our use of common room. So when I got back, she had pushed our use of the product forward in a way that I got to learn and grow from. from. Um, and then she also left me a feedback and ideas for improvement. Like, hey, here's what I did. Here are the things I wish I did, but didn't get to. Now let's discuss whether or not you carry those forward. And then lastly, did reality and expectations diverge? And honestly, sometimes. Sometimes reality and expectations went like this, where you're like, wow, that is different than I thought it would be. And I think a lot of this comes down to, you know, time management, what might take me two hours might take her eight, what might take me eight hours might take her two. So there's just a learning curve there. Volume expectations varied, right? Sometimes there's a ton of things happening in the community and a ton of things to look after. And sometimes no one comes to an event. You're like, okay, what does that mean? And what should I do in the interim? And then lastly, I think, um, the outside can often look smoother than what's happening on the inside, right? And so um, I, I think it's like it's like on the outside, it's like, oh, this probably runs like really buttoned up. And then you get in there and you're like, 
wow, there's like a lot of conversations to navigate, you know, a lot of stakeholders to bring together a lot of moving parts, even in a small team and in a small company. And so um, I think there are just these, sometimes you're like, oh yeah, I'll deliver six events. And uh, this one sees that to me the most. Nikki was like, you know, we're thinking like three to five events. And I was like, start with one, start with one excellent event because it's going to take a long time. Um, and so I think moments like this, right, where, um, where what we want to do and the reality of what we can do while also holding time for that community manager self-care, sometimes as they're going to diverge and how do we bring them back together? Um, Nikki, anything you want to add here? I would love to add so much. I wish we had like another 30 minutes. Um, but I think like B plus is a, is, I, is nice. <laughs> it's a nice grade to hear. Um, and I think that like the most important thing that came from this was, um, especially you coming back and asking and like reviewing the work that happened was, uh, I learned so much about being able to like, just go like, uh, especially with shifting priorities. Like as soon as you left, the company was like, no, nah, we're going to like kind of focus in this area. And it, it had nothing to do with what we had talked about. And so it was like, okay, how can I adjust from like what we wanted to what's happening? And also like, what would Rebecca want to have happen? And then what do I, and it's so at the, all the same time, I'm glad we got a B plus. Um, but I would love to talk about this a lot more uh, in the future. The only thing I want to say here really quick is that B plus grade to be very clear is not a grade of what I think Nikki did. That was me grading me being like how much I set you up for success in the framework to empower you to do what you wanted. You were an A plus plus. Let's just make that very clear. <laughs> grade was not like a, how did Nikki do with must haves? And I did not realize that I can see why it was interpreted that way. And uh, my bad. No, like, how did we do together? How did we do? Plus. Yeah, how did we do? And no, how, love can we, it. how can we align those a little better? Um, so this is where <laughs> you can find out about us. Um, we have four minutes left. I saw Sue Jean can't come back on. So she's probably like, okay, get to Q&A. Um, please reach out to us, Twitter, LinkedIn, the community community where you can find Nikki, the Uncommon community on Slack. Um, you can join us on Slack here. And let's go to Q&A. Um, unless, Sue Jean, do you want to... Sure. Well, I'll be happy to moderate for the audience, but thank you so much, Rebecca and Nikki. That was fantastic. And I think that really resonated with so many community builders out there, just navigating through change and managing self-care along with all of the other things that are happening within their own companies. So let me go ahead and read a few questions because we are getting some plus ones like upvoting here. So I'll, we'll have a few minutes here, but the first question is, I'd love to know more ways you add daily delight to regular things in your day. So for example, like naming your deep dive meetings parties, but what else and what ways for you personally have you added daily delight to your day? I mean, I think yeah, you daily go. delight is, is me just being myself. I think like um, a lot of times there's like this perception of what you should be within uh, a corporate environment or like a, you know, at work. Um, and so it's been really important for me to show up as me. And so like naming things parte is like a very me thing. Um, and I have to shy away from like, what, what impression does this make? Um, but also uh, every, this is not daily, but every Wednesday at work, I ask like a fun icebreaker question. Shout out to Rebecca's icebreaker doc she shared. <laughs> um, and uh, to get to know my my teammates because I'm new there and I want to know you know what they like and what they don't like and what how they would talk about their jobs and so that's been really important too. It's just like how can I create human moments for myself um, to show up as a human but also have human interactions with my colleagues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate you saying showing up as a human and not just coworker or our titles, but just as a human as we are. So. That's Eugene, point. would we be able to in the in the email that has this recording? Would we be able? This, there's this icebreaker doc that's a collaborative doc that I believe is based on this book called The Art of Noticing. I think is the mm -hmm. title. If I'm not getting that incorrect, um, but I'd be happy to share that. It's a it's a crowdsourced document of like yeah. you know if you were a potato, how would you be served or something <laughs> like that. And it goes anywhere from philosophical to to fun. Um, 
but I think it's been a really useful doc in helping people think yeah. about things in a different way. So I'd love to yeah. be able to share folks. Um, yeah, absolutely. We can definitely include that. Uh, I have one more question I wanted to squeeze in because we got a lot of questions on this. But people are curious about the swag store idea. Can you share a little bit more about the details, like what went into this, why this came up? So feel free to share more about that. Yeah, the like 60 second version is basically Rebecca had mentioned like, hey, this is something that I had wanted to be able to do and haven't been able to make time for. And so um, when I got in, I have a background in promotional products. And so I was like, okay, I can design. So I was like, okay, I, this is something that's fun for me and I can do really quickly. And so with the help of some internal designers was able to create designs. Um, they already had a setup with a, uh, a vendor. And so I was able to go through their vendor to get some ideas. And then, um, I don't know, Rebecca, can we say who, who you're with or like, yeah, yeah. We use CODIS yeah. as a vendor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So CODIS, uh, is able to set up like a, um, a web store for you. And so you, they warehouse your stuff and then you're able to ship it out. It's really helpful. And then to follow up on that. So the, the, what Nikki had said when she had left is like, Hey, I created the swag store. But what I didn't get to was creating, you know, the workflow and the right criteria for when mm -hmm. we send this out to folks. And so using Common Room, I created a workflow and I set the criteria where it's like, if someone has, you know, eight or more um, non-self replies within a month in our Slack, and they have four or more organic original posts within a month, mm -hmm. um, and that they are in Slack. And there's a few more criteria. Maybe we can put this in the, um, I have a Loom video about it um, yeah. in the email as well. But we set up that criteria. So then it's automatically triggered when someone is super contributory, contrib contributional <laughs> um, <laughs> in Slack, right? Then that workflow automatically sends and it, and it has, you know, my language and our community leader language and messaging in it. That's like, thank you so much for how you're giving, how much you're giving back to the community. Mm -hmm. Here's a special link to a special gift as a token of our appreciation. We see you. Um, and so so it's sort of like I had I, I knew where I wanted to go, hadn't been able to get there. Nikki was like, I know how to get there. I'll take you there. And then as she was, you know, offboarding herself and onboarding me back on, I was like, thank you so much for setting that up. Now I can make sure to close the loop on this. And so it was yeah. sort of maybe a, a encompasses totally um, our collaboration overall. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a beautiful example, like the perfect example of collaboration. And each of you were leveraging your own tools your own skill sets and being able to bring that to life. I think that's really amazing. So I hope that provides some inspiration for those tuning in and watching. Um, but once again, thank you so much for being here. We're happy to post this recording and Rebecca, we'll talk about what else you want to include in that post event email, but I um, hope everyone else has a wonderful rest of your day and we'll see you at the next masterclass. Thanks so thank much. Thank you so much. What a Bye, joy. Bye everyone.